energy drink we had a few hours ago. <laughs> now, let's do it. <laughs> so I've I've just been twiddling my fingers waiting for you guys. Well, the wait is over because we are live right now. So hey, good morning. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Good morning, world. Yeah, welcome to Drawing for Tattooers. I'm your host, James Wisdom, and with me today we've got Medusa Slays, Elise. Amber, Stephen, thanks everybody for coming. It's um, it's great to have you. How's uh, how's how's it going, gang? It's going good. Yeah. <laughs> good. So, uh, so Medusa was telling us telling telling us just before we went on, you're uh, you're running on a little bit of sleep, but you're super excited because you're getting tattooed today. Oh my god. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. Try to get yeah. a nap in before the tattoo. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to try that. I don't want to try getting tattooed with no sleep. You might get a good nap out of it. I think more people should try it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Be one of those people that me. falls asleep during their tattoo. Maybe. You never know. Ah, oh, God, those people. Oh no, you don't during the tattoos. Just like wake up. <laughs> you can't fall asleep at the bar. You can't fall asleep during the tattoo. <laughs> you gotta be here with me. If I'm stuck with you, you're stuck with me. <laughs> no, that's my story. The one that I got, I slept through the entire thing. I don't even remember most of it. Really? I would say I would sleep through like 80, 80 to ninety percent of the tattoo. Yeah. She had to like tap me to wake me up at the end <laughs> hmm. you ever have that happen steven anybody do your customers anybody, ever fall, asleep? Anybody fall asleep do they do, do they uh, ever uh, fall asleep do you ever fall asleep uh, getting tattooed um uh, no and i've had one person fall asleep but if somebody says they're trying to um i tell them i'm not about it they got to be awake you know what i mean like i'm afraid that they might jump or something in their sleep or uh, have some sort of adverse reaction. So you got to be awake. That is, I think that's sound advice. It's always yeah. good. I just remember like uh, the, that news story, like the lady face. Been, like 10, yeah, the lady face. Like, yeah. yeah, where she's like, I fell asleep and they did this. And I was like, yeah. And then you find out that she actually asked for it. Yeah, but like I'm always afraid like if somebody falls asleep or anything, they're gonna wake up with the tattoo that they fucking asked for that they wanted that we agreed <laughs> to, but then they're gonna be all like I was asleep and I didn't want that. And I'll just be <laughs> well, you gotta be awake. You gotta be awake and tell me no just, if you don't I can't imagine falling asleep during a tattoo. I can't. I mean it I don't hate it like some people do, but I can't imagine falling asleep. Well My it was friend she had me reclined back. I was like snuggled up to the side. She had a very soft voice. Like it was a very, <laughs> a very tranquil environment. Yeah. Where were you getting tattooed? Oh, it was someplace in Crown Point. It was called Black, Black Raven, Black Ink, or something. I can't remember the place. Where but it was in Crown Point. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's on my arm. Okay. I can't the place. All right. I mean, yeah. I guess I dozed off a little bit when I was getting my forehead tattooed, but mm -hmm. I took a Xanax. <laughs> That'll be so, I can see having so. to do that before you get your forehead tattooed. Yeah. yeah I'm not going to like it, say, it, say that people should do that. <clears throat> yeah. If this is not, this is not a uh, medical You're not for entertainment them. purposes <laughs> only. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I make yeah. my own poor decisions. Don't right. do what I do. <laughs> exactly. No, uh, yeah, it's uh, so, right. Bactine. Bactine works better than drugs, right? You gotta, <laughs> <laughs> just use, use lots of Bactine. It numbs the area really nicely, you know, makes it much more, uh, much more tolerable. So mm -hmm. be sure to use that. It's, um, it, it's it's a really uh, uh it can be really helpful right especially on those long ones you start you know get the, the skin all opened up right lots of lots of tattoo going on and then back teen i know that that's always um 
just like like knowing that it's that it's coming it's like oh i feel better already right <laughs> so <laughs> well now team, i've seen uh, i've seen that some tattoo artists don't like using the like creams or whatever because they say that it can mess up your lines or whatever is that true or no i have noticed uh, yeah i don't know hey everybody i'm like uh for some reason, we're not live right now for whatever oh, reason. No. So let oh, me... no, I just noticed that. Yeah, I just, somebody just let me know. So let me, uh, let me see if we can't uh, figure it out. So you all, yeah, talk amongst yourselves. So what were you saying, Medusa? I was going to say, um, I actually have a client who, uh, she is so amazing. And we finally finished a project that we've been working on for a long time. She's wonderful, but she just can't sit for very long. And, you know, everybody's pain tolerance is different. So mm -hmm. not, not her fault. Um, but as we've been going on through the course of our appointments, um, she's been trying out, out different numbing things. And like, I can tell when she uses a different product. Mm -hmm. because of how her skin reacts and mm. I don't remember which stuff did what because I mean she couldn't remember the brand names or anything either she's uh but like it is really different for everybody and some artists will say they don't like it because they've had one person come in where their skin got like super rubbery and inflamed mm. and didn't really react oh. very well after applying the thing so they don't want to take that risk for anybody yeah that is a person to person thing and like with this client in particular I think she went through like two different creams and then a spray stuff and mm -hmm. the spray stuff I remember because it lasted longer she was able to sit longer I was able to like go like do a second pass over a couple of parts and everything without her flinching mm -hmm. and the skin didn't get all puffy and raised and rubbery so mm -hmm. like it's there's so many variables. It really is different yeah. with every product and every person's skin type. Um, and I think generally when an artist says, I don't like it, I don't want to do with it. It's because they probably have had somebody with the wrong cream, with the wrong skin type, and they don't want to take that risk for everybody, which is fair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, if like you Always leave, play it safe. If you leave the topicals on too long before the tattoo, it makes the hair follicle areas harder to tattoo. Oh, I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah, I've had ones like you're supposed to leave the topical on for an hour before you start. If you leave it on for more than an hour, things get really swollen because there's ephedrine in it. Which oh. it it makes the parts where the hair would come out really hard to tattoo. I've done tattoos where the I was packed solid, and then when it healed, everywhere a hair was growing in was no ink. Weird. But I like the sprays you use after you break the skin, like um, what's it called? Saint Mark makes it holy water. I hear you a spray lot of it really on, good things about holy water. Yeah, you spray it on after you've broken the skin, and it really does start to work instantly without changing the texture of the skin too much. Yeah, I've heard that holy water basically has the same reliable effects as Vasicane, minus like the blood vessel constriction and stuff that everybody had problems with with Vasicane. And yeah, that's why that's Vasicane kind of fell out of pop. It constricts yeah. the blood vessels. Yeah, I am just, I'm, I'm a slut for some Bactine and I do not mind slathering it all over my clients because the longer they can sit without twitching and complaining the better I can just like do my fucking tattoo and get it done and get your zone yeah but uh yeah I mean back teen works fine I um I personally am I th think if you really need that numbing thing before the tattoo like for me i'm just like go ahead and test it out on your skin first and see how it reacts before your appointment talk to your tattooist you know and do it if they say you can do it you know but the best thing is always to let your adrenaline do the work on your body for you and if you really need it after the skin's broken maybe some back team to help take the edge off but your adrenaline's going to do more for you than any lidocaine temporary lidocaine will 
Mm. I read a story or, you know, it was about, um, somebody maybe post Malone or somebody like, anyway, like he did like a whole, like he got anesthesia and got all this tattoo mm -hmm. work done. This was like, Hmm. So within the last year, I believe something like that. Whoa. I read um, something about that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's, so that is wild that, uh, you know, again, we're talking I think about that's like, a little asleep, dangerous. You know? <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I want to go under anesthesia. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> the, the statistics of not waking up from anesthesia are yeah. big enough that unless I need like life-saving surgery of some kind, no, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. It's, uh, um, well, if you can, uh, you know, if you can afford to have it done, it's very, it's very expensive to have anesthesia done. And so it's, uh -huh. it's a very prohibitive yeah. sort of situation, but, um, well, Hey, I, uh, I just want to let everybody know, like, um, for some reason our stream isn't working. Uh, I know that earlier, like this weekend, um, uh, there was a, we had to reconnect some of the tech together. Mm. Um, Sorry. Anyway, um, uh, so for whatever reason, the stream isn't working now. Um, I I did have some stuff to share. I figured that we could, uh, you know, we could share it, and um, uh, you know, I could basically talk about the thing I was going to talk about today. Um, even though it's, you know, we're prob it's probably not going to work. I I just texted Gabe, and he hasn't gotten back to me. So, um, I don't know if this is going to like. I don't know if this will. This will go out to YouTube or not, but I wanted to let everybody know, you know what I mean, that we're, um, uh, for whatever reason, it seems like the show is broken today. <laughs> so, so, yeah, sorry about We've been that. Let loose. But I'm really, I'm so glad that everybody was able to make it, too. I really, you know, I appreciate everybody coming, and, um, you know, it's awesome. So, um, right. So, uh, I wanted to just, like, let you all know that, you know, make that, that like, you know, the general announcement. So, um, yeah, so let me, let me share, this is what I was going to share today. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen. Mm -hmm. Right. Cool. So I wanted to talk about Gestalt. So, all right. Now, this is um, this is a word I know, Elise. You'd be familiar with it. Yeah. If you've never heard of this as a uh, as a concept before, Gestalt was developed by by psychologists, Gestalt psychologists, and it's um, it's a way of thinking about how we visually organize space, um, how we perceive things. This is really helpful in terms of designing stuff. So, there's some just some basic language that I think once you, you know, uh, uh, a, a lot of it, of course, you've, you've heard these words before, and it'll probably make sense. And it, if it feels intuitive in a certain way, that makes sense, because these are, these are like psychologies that are, um, I think that are, that are working um, for, you know, that we're always sort of like, uh, using all the time, whenever we're looking at stuff, whenever we're designing things, but being aware of them, can really help uh, help you be a lot more intentional as far as like you know your your designing process goes. So, just want to talk about a couple of these really sort of simple uh, simple ideas. And so this was uh, this was a presentation. It was made uh, made by a former colleague named Misha Goro, and uh, um, it's it's based on the work of uh, uh, Walschlager and uh, Schneider in their book. Uh, basic visual concepts and principles for artists and architects. So um, continuance uh, or continuation. Um, this is the first principle that we're going to talk about. And so when figures are, I'll re just kind of read this for you, like in, in uh, uh, when figures are arranged in such a way as we have a direction, they seem to continue. Um, and so this property can be used for figures or a group of figures. So we'll look down here. And so with this example, we can kind of see just visually, right? These three smokestacks, um, 
even though the, their steam is not connected, right, they're not physically connected, we visually, right, we will continue, you know, our eyes will move along this, this pathway. Um, a lot of times when you talk about like, uh, um, you know, painting a landscape or something like that, you know, you wouldn't want to have the trees in continuance, right? Because it really, it moves the eye, right? So you can actually move the eye sort of out of your, you know, out of your like sort of area of interest. Um, but this is a, this is a sort of, this is a phenomenon that happens, right? You, we, I feel like we can really see that. You, you can probably go either direction, either sort of, you know, over to the, to the left or, you know, up and to the right. This is, um, this is just, uh, this is just sort of an invisible line that we infer, right? So as far as designing things, you know, you may want to use this principle or you may want to avoid it. But again, continuation, continuance, we're using these words interchangeably. This might be sort of helpful for you to think about. And so the other the other way that we that we see this happening all the time, uh, constellations right that concept uh, when you we'll talk about another concept that helps out with this but obviously sort of like aligning stars you know this is something that people have done for millennia and how do they you know how do you how can you sort of convey that to others right it's it's through this phenomenon this continuation continuance when we our eyes will move and scan across the scene we're going to make these connections right so um yeah i mean it's a, it's uh it's it's really fascinating and I'm, I'm sure sort of like you know you can hopefully you'll start thinking about this you know like oh yeah there there it is this visually this line sort of continues there's another really great example here right we can see these um see all these pillars right and they're just they're moving uh visually right there's our eyes are just sort of you know um they're sort of led if you like, right across this, the flow. So, so yeah, even though these are, these pillars are divided, right? Separating the pedestrian zone from traffic, they're not physically connected, but our, ah, but our perception groups them together, right? So it has a, has a clear sense of direction. Again, so this is something that you, you know, that you may sort of, um, and naturally and intuitively sort of pick up on something that you kind of probably do already but this is the this is the you know this is thinking about it in terms of a um you know a concept continuation continuance similarity so um as far as similarity we tend to group things based on their similarity right again that's kind of what this what this whole concept is about. It's about being able to, uh, you know, group things together and it's for design purposes, right? For us, how do people see, how do people think about things? So, um, I always like this example. So we see these very, uh, these very similar like shapes, right? But because of their orientation, we're going to naturally kind of group them right into their vertical or their horizontal relationship. So, you know, when we see the pattern, we see a pattern like this, um, or we're trying to develop one, this is the sort of, this is the sort of mode that you can start to, to get into. You can think about how similar are things, right? Or how can I group them in such a way that's going to help this, um, you know, help convey. I think there's a, there's of course like a, you know, a third pattern that's not being, you know, that's not being sort of explicitly stated here. And that's all the space between um, all of these little shapes, right? So again, there's like, there's another pattern, you know, so if, if we were going to use, um, if you were going to design some sort of, uh, you know, geometric shape for a tattoo, let's say, or, you know, or, or any sort of like, any sort of pattern based thing, sort of having this repetition of similarity again that's a way to um that's a way to add you know some continuity or of course like making things dissimilar is going to um bring some variety so there's another another example here 
right? So again, tonal, tonal value in this case, right? All of these are squares. They're all the same size, but we're going to kind of naturally group them in relation to their tonal value, how dark, how light. Um, and these are, uh, again, this is sort of intuitive. This is how people like to, you know, uh, they tend to think about things. So, um, so yeah, instead of, instead of just this single block unit, there's a little bit of uh, um, variety, right? It, if this were all just solid, you know, it would, it would certainly, you know, be interesting to a certain degree or could be beautiful, but at the same time having this, this difference, um, it ends up like kind of mm, making it have variety, have more interest, have some sort of like differentiation and, um, Right, similarity, this is the, ah. So here's where I think, I think this is a really nice example of like, like how is this sort of thing um, uh, uh, really important? Well, we can see like, hopefully you can see like railroad tracks and then like a crosswalk. And so, you know, the fact that we can sort of instantly recognize this is really going to help us sort of navigate the world, right? It's It's good that you can see that so you don't like, you know, inadvertently step on the train track at the wrong time or that you make sure that you get into the crosswalk these sorts of uh you know basic intuitions um again we're thinking about it in terms of like how do we organize space how are uh how do we see when we see shapes how do we perceive them how do we read them and so again uh there's a similarity. In this case, we're talking about like things that are similar. The train tracks, they're all similar. The crosswalk shapes, they're all similar. Um, we group them together very quickly, instantaneously almost. You're, you're going to see the patterns, you're going to recognize them. But, um, you know, when it's, uh, when, when you're just sort of going about your day, you may not necessarily, you know, sort of, uh, you may not necessarily be aware that you're perceiving all of this information and processing it in a certain way. So this is again just sort of a um, just a, a reminder, an awareness of how how complicated it, you know the that you're that all the visual stimuli is right. So if we can break it down into simple things, right? Like we just talk about continuation, similarity, these sorts of simple things. It's going to help us communicate better. It's also going to help us with our, you know, when we're composing things. Again, sort of another great example of these similar, uh, similar shapes, right? Grouping them in particular ways, right, based on their uh, similarity. So these flowers versus this leaf motif, very nice. Um, and then again, sort of alternating in a certain way, um, there becomes a rhythm. Right, there becomes a pattern, and this is um, this is this is an example of similarity. All right, proximity. All right, so again, we're talking about Gestalt. It's design. It's about sort of thinking about how design works, and so um, when we're thinking about design. We're grouping things together. So continuation, as we saw before, helps us sort of move our eye around that's a, it's continuation of our of our eye movement um similarity we're recognizing the shapes right of and relating things together right so like we just like we just saw the flower and the leaf we're we're relating those things together right there's flowers there's leaves we're, we've made two groups um we're grouping things together proximity we're gonna we're going to relate things together based on how close they are together as well. This is uh, this is fairly um, again intuitive, but this can be very helpful. So, right. So here's a, an example of hieroglyphs. So, in terms of these hieroglyphs, we're thinking about them, right? As instead of just one big block of you know of, of you know like unintelligibility, they are proximate. And we can see them based like in rows, right? You can see the you can see how it's illustrated here. These rows help us distinguish, you know, the relationship. This line, like line number, you know, the top line, we could we can now read that. 
right? Because of the fact that um, these things are proximate together and their relationship, I think is, um, uh, you know, it's, it's orderly. And again, this is, this is how writing, you know, really works. So thinking about things in terms of like, uh, you know, how closely we put them together, it's going to necessarily relate, right? We're going to, we're going to relate things because of how their, uh, you know, their, their proximity to one another. A really interesting, yeah, example here of this group marching around. So we can see, right, that there's all of these, this marching band, right, they're marching down the street, but we're going to group them into into distinct, uh, discrete groups, right? There's a larger group. There's, um, you know, and then there's there's a slightly smaller ones. But again, how are we doing this, right? Because they're they have a proximate relationship to one another, right? So the proximity of uh, of all of the individuals, right? They form these little groups, right? And then of course all of them together make a much bigger group. So this is the this is the principle of proximity. Um, again, very probably very intuitive to you. I always like I like this one too. <laughs> it, I don't know what this picture is from, but it's like uh, you know maybe it's like an estate sale or something like that. But again, so there's rows of of individuals, right? One spoon, for example, you know it might mean something. Maybe it's how you eat your cereal or whatever, stir your coffee. Once you start putting them together with other things like, you know, fork and a knife, oh, now it starts to mean, oh, there's, uh, you know, maybe that's a dinner plate. Once you've got like a dozen spoons, <laughs> you know, you know, like four dozen forks, it starts to mean something different, right? So all this proximity starts to, to form a larger whole, right? That you're a whole thing that is going to be other than just the sum of its parts, right? So we've got one spoon or something like that, that's one part of this group. But once we start adding all of the, you know, all of the things to it, other spoons, other forks, these watches, there's watches down in the corner. Uh, again, there starts to become something different at play. And so again, we're, we're looking at things, we're organizing them we're separating from the background. We talked about this a little bit last time. This uh, this idea of figure and ground. So there's these all these forks, these spoons. They're like figures. We're separating them away from the background. Um, we're also recognizing them in terms of their similarity. The spoons all are similar, right? The forks are similar to the other forks, and so on and so forth. Next, we're we're grouping them uh, because there's some organization here. Right, so we can start to we can separate them from each other, um, uh, and but all of this is sort of happening like background. You're doing it mentally, and you're you you know you may not be aware that you're doing it, but but you're organizing things visually all the time and perceiving them and trying to contextualize it, trying to think about like ascribe meaning to it, thinking about like what, you know, what could be being conveyed, what could be sort of being meant by it. And these are, um, you know, again, uh, you think about, again, some continuation, similarity, proximity in terms of your designing. Again, it can be very powerful for you and help you become very intentional. Here's some more groups, right? Again, you know, there's all these people sitting around table and we can see clearly like that we just, you know, like we're going to group them, group number one, group number two. Um, you could go further and start to think about similarity, right? How many people are standing versus how many people are sitting, um, uh, how many people have, you know, things in front of, you go down the list, right, of, of all the similarities and all of the proximities that you have. but again, there's like going to be a sort of a basic level where you're thinking about like, you know, grouping things into discrete groups, number one and number two here in this case. Um, closure. So, all right. So the, so the first three things that we talked about, 
uh, continuation, similarity, and proximity. Those are grouping laws or principles, right? They help us to think about how we group things together. This last one, closure, is, um, is about imagination. And so uh, I think that, it, that this idea kind of helps to tie the other ones together in a certain respect. So um, see, closure is a property of both perceived shapes and the proximity of similar shapes. Viewers have a tendency to, to close or complete incomplete figures or grouped configurations. So let's check it out. Right. So this um, very famous symbol, um, the heart shape. We think about it, it's, it reads as love. We're culturally conditioned to see it that way, but you know, um, so again, that wouldn't necessarily be intuitive, but if you can, you know, if you can read language, you can read English words, um, I think there, there's a strong likelihood that you have encountered this shape and understand it to have a symbolic meaning, right? So when we, uh, when we place it uh, here, right? When we see this, we see this very famous artwork by Milton Glaser. We can read that as, as saying, uh, you know, I love New York, for example. Again, this is a, um, maybe, you know, think about other ways this could work. Like sometimes people like would maybe use a rose or something like that. Again, you could also, there's, a, there's other symbols that have like, uh, that have meaning. And again, we can, you can, you know, almost place them as a word, as language, right? So this is an example of closure. This is an example of how our imaginations will start to, to uh, group, work in, work in terms of the groups and also give us, uh, um, give us a little bit more meaning, a little more context. So how can you read words that, uh, you know, don't necessarily, you know, that aren't, that aren't, fit, you know, aren't completed, right? We'll close them. So in this, in this example, it's illustrated over here. It says, look right. I would, I would suggest you could probably make out this word, probably, without this, uh, without the, without the helpful example next to it. Why? It's, it's because of this notion of closure that we, as perceptive beings, we're going to like use our imagination to try to bring together what it is that we're, we're going to try to think about uh, what it is that we're looking at. We're going to try to understand it. So um, I like this. Uh, <laughs> I always like this illustration. Again, so in terms of graphic design, you know, I think we're gonna we're gonna think that we're sort of seeing this, you know, the this person's head, right? Becomes their hair, becomes all of these all these words. What we can see, I think, all of these other examples of uh, these ideas, these grouping ideas, used here. So, for example, the proximity, right, of all of the of all of the words to this person's head. Um, we, we group those together as it's, it's a part of the same group, but distinct, right? It's, it, you know, there's words and there's this person's face, but, you know, even though we can make that distinction, they're so close together, we're going to see them as, you know, as a, as a particular group, right? Again, there's a similarity. They're all, you know, there's all letters there, right? So there, there's a, there's similarity. There's, there are letters so we can read them. And then again, um, uh, there's a continuation, right? There's all of the, you know, the words are arranged in a certain way that we can read them. It's not just a jumble of letters in this particular case. And, the, you know, uh, they're, they're organized. So that way you can read distinct, distinct words, groups of words as sentences. And then, of course, we're going to relate all of those words that are the hair as, you know, as likely being uh, a cohesive group of words, then we can't help but to sort of relate it to this person's head, right? 
And then again, through closure, we might start to think about a meaning. Maybe that's what this person is thinking about. There's the word that's, there's the word thoughts that's included at the bottom as well. Again, another sort of strong connection, word to, uh, you know, the, the word to whatever it is that, uh, you know, seems to be sort of um, illustrated through the image. So, um, yeah, closure, imagination, right? So to kind of close on that, like that is the, that's what um, is always happening, right? There's sort of a, we're always imagining like what it is that we see. We want to come up with some sort of, um, you know, we want to try to understand it. We want to make it meaningful, but where does it begin? And again, so these very simple ideas, continuation, visual continuation, similarity, grouping things that are similar together, right? In, in shape, in size, um, in, uh, in terms of tonal value, right? Um, uh, proximity, how close are things together? Like how close are things related together? Like how, you know, how close are they to one another? When they're very close together, we're going to group them, right? As these are this, this, I'm to read this as a group of things, right? Or as, you know, um, or like my coffee cup, right? It's, it seems like one thing, but it's all these different parts, right? <laughs> you know? They're all similar in terms of color, but like, you know, but this part is different from this part and there's, you know, there's a void in it and there's coffee in it, right? It's a group. It's a group of things. When you were designing, let's say you're designing it for a tattoo, right? You're going to have a group of, things, you know, you may have a group of things that are trying to come together. Um, you may have to put a new tattoo next to other ones, right? They're always going to be related in some way, right? Because of their proximity. They're going to be related in some way because of their similarity. They're also going to be related in how it moves, how it flows, the continuation on the body. I want to try to tie this to sort of things that we're, you know, that we're interested in too. But, um, you know, do you have to memorize all these terms and stuff? Not really. It's, you know, I wanted to talk about it and, you know, and um, I think it's a very interesting concept. And I also feel like, um, you know, when you, it, when you, when you, when you do start to engage with, with some of these ideas, um, again, it can really be powerful. And in, in so far as like bringing attention to your work, bringing attention to your intention, to your critiquing, right? So if you're going to critique your own work, if you're going to critique the work of others could really use some of these notions to, you know, to bring together, um, you know, very, something very constructive. So anyway, that was it. That was what I, that was what I wanted to talk about today was the, uh, <laughs> was those design ideas and stuff. Thank you, you so much for explain listening. Explain to me why I put together my still lifes the way I do. I yeah. hope, I hope that that was, uh, um, that you were able to take something from that and connect it to, to you know, because it was really basic, right? There was a lot yeah. of really basic stuff in there, but I think you can really, you know, uh, I know for me, um, like, it really was, it, it's really, there's, even though it's, it feels basic, it's, it's really kind of challenging to, 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 to comprehend it or to, uh, to really put it into play. Um, so I don't want to pretend like it's easy, but it, but there's a, there's a basic quality to it that I think can really be helpful. And so um, I guess I, you know, I do think about similarity and, and then, you know, flow or continuation, um, how things are proximate. I think about it a lot when I'm designing stuff. Um, and so uh, I, 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 I've found that it's helped me, as I, you know, once, uh, you know, as I've um, continued to develop in my, you know, my, my practice. And so I was hoping that this would be, you know, useful and helpful for you all as well. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank well, you so much. Yeah. I think it does help to think about just because I know sometimes there's a struggle with um, making things feel alive um, you can get into kind of a rut of making things seem too cookie cutter 
uh, like how you were talking about all of the pieces connect. So it just seems a bit too much like, oh, a computer could have done that. So uh, making it seem more natural by break, being aware of that and breaking it up can really help. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, uh, there are times when you will want to use some of that stuff in order to like sort of, um, you know, to manipulate it, right? You're going to want to use it so that way it's to your advantage. Um, but I think occasionally, you know, things can be sort of happening, you know, like something's too close together, there's too many similar things, or there's not enough similar things, it's too disjunct. Our eye moves out of the composition, you know, these sorts of things. Um, I think it relates to the idea of like a, you know, of, of tangency as well so you know sometimes like mm, sometimes like uh you know you'll have a you'll have a line sort of a line with another line and it's like it's it's it is it can sort of it can be a really powerful moment because our eye will be attracted to it but at the same time um it can be a very distracting moment too so if it's not your intention then being aware of it, I think it's going to, you know, can help you avoid like, uh, you know, uh, distracting things from your composition. So whenever you're composing things, it can be really be um, uh, good to take a step back, think about the basic sorts of relationships. And that can really be, you know, that can really be helpful too. So. Mm -hmm. I think the grouping of things together can also help you establish your foreground and your background in tattooing. Because if you make sure you group the background Im um, images together, and then you group the foreground images together and give them a dynamic contrast, mm. it makes a better tattoo. Yep. Yes, yeah, I agree. I agree that, um, you know, uh, playing with that, sort of playing with that notion, you know, you can, you can uh, certainly, I think, um, have more command of what it is that you're trying to develop, you know, image wise. So, you know, if you want to have similar things in the foreground, you know, similar things, you know, sort of middle ground, similar things in the background. Um, Again, you can sort of play with this idea. You can you can use different scales, different sizes of things, and that can also like using them in so then so using them in different registers. You have something that's like similar to the similar in the foreground, in the background, but at a different scale. Perhaps it becomes you know uh, you know another another thing that like adds interest, that adds meaning, something that yeah. can be readable uh, for your um, uh, for your design. So again, it's the, you probably heard this before the, you know, um, the whole, right. Is, is, uh, you know, is, uh, or, yeah, the, the greater than the sum of its parts, that, that sort of phrase, right. Um, I stumbled over it, but the idea is that the whole thing is other than the sum of its parts, right? Like once you start to group, like you talked about like foreground, middle ground, background, those three elements right those are maybe those are groups within a larger whole system right once yes. you put them all together it becomes something other right it becomes it becomes a scene right other than just like maybe there's uh maybe there's something really specific one thing in the foreground but that's not the whole scene that's not the whole sort of picture and so thinking about how each one of these components uh like a symphony, they all work together to sort of to to create a, a larger composition. Well, this is the you know this is the thing as as designers because that's what we do. You know, even if even if you're just taking like individual you know design you know flash designs, right? Somebody's getting them all over the place. You're still in the placement composing a larger composition. Does this make sense? And even you know, like that, like even if somebody says like stick it here, it still is you're still putting it, you're still putting it in a particular way in a particular place, right? 
there is, there's all sorts of decisions that are going to ultimately be up to you as the designer. Um, and so, again, I think uh, that's the idea, or that's the idea to sort of keep it simple and to try to think about how things relate in certain ways. So, um, so yeah, I hope that was, uh, I hope that was enjoyable. And I hope that like, you know, um, kind of talking to, like, kind of like, you know, thinking about, um, you know, when you start learning bones, right? You start learning human anatomy, you can kind of develop like this, this extra sense, like a, like almost like an x-ray vision. Um, uh, that when you start thinking about this basic groups, we start thinking about these basic sort of um, design ideas that you that you start seeing the world in a different way, right? That you start maybe seeing your own work in a different way. Um, so ultimately, you know, if you can if you can break things down into shape, value, and edge, those notions will really take you really far, I think. They're really going to be very helpful in sort of cutting through all of the um, the complexity, whatever it is that you want to end up sort of uh, conveying. Instead, you'll start to pay attention to those very basic things, relate them particularly, and be much more intentional, be much more um, efficient in your your compositions and the way you make work. So, um, so yeah. Yes, Medusa. Hey, <clears throat> um, actually that, I really like uh, what you're getting at about relatability, like the viewer being able to like understand the concepts immediately and everything. Uh, yesterday I was uh, listening to an interview about marketing for artists and creating content and a big topic that they were hitting on is that people really like things that they understand and that they're familiar with like as we all know like people that don't understand something are more likely to either be afraid of it not like it want to push it away um so i really like that your examples are things that people already understand um, the relatability is not just uh, a way to create something that uh, can be um, perceived the way it's supposed to be perceived, but it also attracts people if they understand it. Like that statue, for example, it's missing a head and arms, but I know it's supposed to be there and I like it because I already know what it's supposed to be. Um, but if I didn't understand what heads and arms were, I would be confused as fuck and probably be like, that's a stupid statue. <laughs> like, what the fuck? That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. I, I mean, I haven't really seen a person walking around without a head or arms, but like, I know that that's supposed to be there. So like, um, but yeah, no, I was just thinking about the whole relatability thing. People like what they understand and can relate to. So that's also just an attraction, a visual attraction. Sorry, I don't know if I worked. No, that thank one. you. No, I appreciate that. I think that's like um I'm glad. I'm glad that it's um, you know, that it uh what we talk hopefully what what I was, you know, the things I was talking about didn't seem too out of left field. I know that the the you know, the terms so this was like so what I just talked about is has always been a really big part of what I've had to of what I've had to teach in the past. It's always been something that you know was uh, that was really emphasized as a really important um, you know concept uh, for you know for art students to 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 get behind. And I think the language sort of you know using these words can be daunting. You know, again, it's like, oh, I've heard these words before, but like really using them, um, again, it's it's not relatable necessarily, right? But hopefully with some, you know, with some of the visual, uh, you know, relationship, sort of see these, um, see these images and then relate them to the language because a, because a word helps you, um, helps you hold on to something. All right, like mentally, you see, you have a picture of something in your mind, you have a word to go with it. 
there's there's a there's a lot of connection that you have now um so i think um uh it's always uh, it's it's a challenging subject matter this and the and the language feels foreign in a certain respect but the whole idea is really simple it's it's about being simple right <laughs> rather than it is simple it's about simplicity and so and relatability just like medusa was talking about like hopefully it's things that people can understand so and i guess i just you know i i right away i think about like you know designing you know some kind of you know pattern or something for tattoos like a you know like a geometric pattern or you know what's referred to as tribal you know <laughs> that sort of a thing right um yeah yeah that's the um that's that's what how i want to relate these these things together they're really um really a lot of graphic design is sort of based on these ideas so when you think about how how words are laid out on you know in magazines and stuff a lot of these ideas are are just um very common to for graphic designers to use and that's it that falls on us too right like we have to we have to use you know when you're designing tattoos you got to put words in there all the time <laughs> somebody wants the you know names in it you know what i mean it's like you know um or they just want a name this big sure. oh wow it's a bold I choice an arm just yeah the whole forearm now i have I a name is kid dominance oh what are you gonna say elise i have a question when it comes to um designing a tattoo and value and I'm hoping that I can pose this in a way that doesn't sound problematic. <laughs> I just, so people come in a, an array of colors, right? So when you're designing a tattoo, let's say you haven't seen the person, like if you design a tattoo, like on a white, <laughs> like a white screen, and then the person comes in and you go, oh no. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, like, is there something different you have to do? Because I know... When I was looking for a place to get my tattoo, I'm just like, I don't see any brown people <laughs> portfolio. I'm not going here. Like that that's my thought. Cause I know I've seen tattoos on people my complexion. I'm just like <laughs> it doesn't look right. So I just wonder because I, I, I see a difference between people's tattoos, like, oh that looks that shows up better than this. Like, is there a different way to account for value? in that way. I don't know if I said that. Correct. I, d I don't think any artist should be tattooing on a canvas that they haven't seen mm. yet. Yeah. Uh, even with uh, um, like long distance tattooers and stuff, even if you're doing like a consultation through email, mm -hmm. the artist will usually ask to see the area you want tattooed or ask for a video call first. Um, uh, but yeah, there is a value change versus the tone of skin. With darker skin tones, usually you want to um, heighten the contrast <laughs> a little bit. But I'm not nearly as experienced as I think uh, Stephen and James would be. So mm. I just wanted to say nobody should be tattooing a, <laughs> some skin they haven't looked at yet. Yeah, <laughs> so, so, like run away. <laughs> Yes, yeah, Steve, Medusa, what do you think? I think Medusa's right. You just boost the contrast. Um, I mean, I think at a certain point, you know, uh, you'll lose detail on, on if the skin's, uh, you know, dark enough. But if you boost the contrast, then you should still be able to tattoo them. You just might not get so many midtones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think uh, that's all very sound advice. And it, it makes sense. Right. So there's a certain, um, you know, uh, you, you really don't, you really get a false impression on like a white piece of paper. Right. And so when, you know, so much flash when I first started tattooing was all on white background, you know what I mean? So, or even if it's like brightly colored, it's still like bright colors against a, you know, on top of a white background. Right. So you're totally right that there is going to be this difference, you know, because 
there's so many different complexions. There really are. There's, there's you know, there's just a myriad complexions. And so how do you design for that? You, you do need to take into consideration, you know, uh, an individual's specific needs. And mm. so, um, and so, yeah, no, you may like, how do you, how do you increase the contrast? I think through some of these ideas that we were just talking about, um, you know, like you may like sort of have to go slightly larger, right? So, you know, if you're going to do lettering or something, it may need to be bigger. So that way you get, you know, enough visual contrast. Maybe the, sh you, like Stephen was saying, you don't have as many mid-tones. It's more of a, you know, really dark darks and then the lightest light, which would be the, the flesh itself. Um, lighter colored inks, white ink, for example. It's not opaque. It's not a white paint. You can apply it a few times and then you can make something slightly lighter, but even still, you know, it's- you can't Once it really heals, you still have to take into consideration the healing of that skin tone. Mm. Right. Exactly, the healing of various, you know, everybody heals a little differently. It depends on a lot of different factors. And, you know, and, and tattoos are always, it always changes the surface. You know what I mean? Uh, rather than say like they all scar, which they maybe kind of do, like a little to a certain degree, it's going to be, a, it's definitely different. The texture of your skin is all, you know, is altered forever. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, there's all kinds of factors that go into it. And, and uh, um, when you just design on white paper, really doesn't give you um, an accurate picture of how you know the needs of you know of, of that particular client medusa hi sorry to keep talking um so one trick that i've been learning because uh i want to be more flexible with my clientele as a tattoo artist and be able to serve a variety of people with different skin tones um uh, as like first of all white paper is a betrayal to everybody like nothing no no nobody's skin is actually snow Even white and if they are like man you might want to go to the doctor, doctor. <laughs> yeah like see a fucking doctor <laughs> yeah um so uh one thing i've been doing for uh my art is for the past couple of months actually i stopped buying white paper i have everything on tan or gray toned things like this project I'm working on right now tan paper um I've got a gray tone sketch pad so I can practice with my uh black and white on um a mid-tone already there all of my paintings are on tan toned I can um and it like because yeah white's a betrayal nothing's fucking white that's stupid. <laughs> Why do they make white paper? It doesn't even make sense. Well, for artists, come on. Um, I mean, like, and when you're painting a canvas, you're not painting on white anyways. Almost, well, I mean, some people do, but most people will, like, put a base layer down to tone down the canvas as is. I don't know why they aren't just selling canvases already toned. Like, they're white all the time. I'm just like, bitch. They just finally started selling black canvases. Yeah, I saw huh? that. That's that's really cool. Uh, they're, but yeah, they're not going to catch up with us very soon. Yeah, the one way to like really practice your values, uh, as far as like you know, art by hand, not digital art, and everything, is to just start buying toned paper. Mm -hmm. Um, it can it really teaches you a lot of flexibility, too. Um. And it also is way better to teach you where to put on those white highlights because, you know, it's not already white. So that's cool. Anyways, that's just my uh, three cents. <laughs> not two cents because it's a little bit too much. <laughs> <laughs> I might feel bad. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I so I agree that there's, um, uh, again, for 
for tattooing purposes and stuff, you know, or for thinking about tattoos again with, you know, with, with white paper, uh, can be, can lead you into, uh, you know, false sense of things. Um, but again, in terms of like, in terms of contrast, in terms of like making things really distinct, um, it's nice that we have that range of values that we can, that we can play with. And so, you know, it, uh, in part, it's like, there's, there's also a, uh, you know, something that happens, you know, um, with white paper, let's say for instance, or white canvas or something like that, where it's actually, you know, why does it look that way? Well, because it's reflecting like the, the spectrum of light back to us. Like from a theoretical point of view, there is no, there is no white. It's not really a color. It's always, you know, um, it's always some sort of, it's always some sort of color, right? Like the word, you know, white and black, they're, um, they're neutral. Yeah, they're generalities, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, even neutral, right? Once you kind of get to this point of like, it's like pure neutrality, it's, it's not that it's it's like it's a slightly warmer or it's slightly cooler right it's like there's there's always this sort of like there's no purity right like <laughs> like so even you know even though like this pure red or something or pure yellow or pure blue whatever you want to whatever you want to say as soon as you get to that point it's not that it's always going to be relative and, and related so when you um so for example like oil paint is all translucent right it's not opaque so what so what is magical about oil painting is that like light actually goes into the surface reflects off the canvas itself and comes back through the paint kind of almost you know almost providing this somewhat of a you know a luminosity to it watercolor is the same thing watercolor is transparent so again it's like there's this reflection that happens and so it almost like it almost brings a sort of light out of those surfaces. Um, and so uh, I think there's a you know there's a there's a real drawback sort of relying on the you know what you can do on paper, what you can do on you know tablet um, versus what you can do on skin. But that's but but there's also a flip side to that. Like you can do stuff on skin that's just not the same thing as you can do in a painting. Or you can do in a drawing right there's a magic to the skin as well because tattoo ink is also translucent right it's again there's going to be light that goes through the surface and comes back out and it's it, it's there's a there's a beauty and a magic to it i think that's like um it's specific to any media that you're going to engage with so mm -hmm. um so i think it's it's important to recognize the distinctions but then there's also something that's really beautiful about, you know, um, again, those distinctions about exactly what makes something particular. And so those are the, um, again, I, you know, your use, use one thing becomes a means to an end, right? So I think about someone like, you know, Sean Barber paints, you know, paintings of people with tattoos often. Right. That's a, that's a, um, that's a subject that he likes to, uh, that he likes to cover. So in a certain way, you know, like all the person's tattoos that they have are, they're kind of a means to his ends, right? Like, so we draw on paper, that's our means to get to the ends for, you know, we're going to do a tattoo, but here it is like sort of the art, like kind of, you know, is copying life. And so, uh, <laughs> so anyway, so all this life is just a means to the end for art in a certain way. I don't know. It's kind of funny, but, um, but yeah. It's like Inception. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm doing a painting of someone who got a tattoo. of. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. A, a painting of someone who got a tattoo of a, of someone getting a painting of a tattoo, right? <laughs> things, yeah. Things like forever, uh, forever reflected. It's funny. Um, Sounds like an Escher print. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, infinitely relatable, right? <laughs> That's a, infinite relatability. Those are the things that I think um, they provide interest for us. So I guess to sort of tie things together today, you know, 
relatability and being able to sort of be intentional with those relatabilities can be just, I think they can be really useful. So I hope this presentation was relatable. <laughs> I Very much it was so. useful. Oh, thank you. I think it um, simplified a lot of stuff for me. Thank you. Awesome. Um, well, even though, uh, you know, we went over this, I think we'll, We'll probably do something different next week because <laughs> because I don't think this was uh, I don't think this I don't think this episode went out. This was just us hanging out and, and you know doing class, even though you know nobody else gets to do it. But um, uh, hey, this one's just but I hope me. that you I hope that you all you know as you're you know designing things and stuff, um, some of this some of this may like you know uh, re recur to you. Some of this may be um, something that you that you find useful as you're working through, you know, maybe in your maybe it helps you out of a jam one day. You know, you're kind of like, how do I how do I relate these things or how do I how do I make these things distinct? And sort of thinking about continuation, similarity, proximity, helping like tying that through some sort of a closure, through some sort of imaginative relationship. Um, Maybe that'll be, maybe that'll be something that like, you know, um, that you find useful. So, but yeah. Uh, does anybody, does anybody have any drawings they'd like to share? I'd love to see any artwork that anybody has. If you want to, if you want to share some artwork, I'd love to see it. I don't uh, have, oh, go ahead, Stephen. No, you go ahead, girl. Okay. <laughs> but um, no, I don't have any drawings, but I have been doing revisions on some of my pieces from my portfolio if you want to check those out i need a hot minute though let me see um, i think i oh god um, where are you <clears throat> let me see okay So, share screen. Can you see it? Oh yeah. Okay. So this this was my original. Um, I turned this into a um, an art exhibition last semester, but I actually did it uh, created this the year before. But um, my teacher wanted it to be a bit more detailed, just because. Um, it's very smooth looking, um, it's very clean looking, but he wanted just a bit more life to it. So I ended up hand painting um, all of like these little rivets. Um, I added a lot of like edges to it. Um, and I even added panels to um, my piece just to make it a lot more lifelike just because it, it kind of looks like a, a plane made of jelly <laughs> in the original one. Um, and uh, I just wanted it to be more lifelike for my uh, my official demo reel that I'm gonna be making. So yeah, that's what I've been working on uh, this weekend. So wait, your it definitely looks more lifelike. Yeah. You're a 3D artist and you basically built this plane out of like nothing in like the computer? Yeah, so we start off with, they're called polygon primitives. Um, so we start off with a cube or a cylinder. I believe I started with a cylinder um, for the main body, cubes for the wings, and then you just kind of add faces um, and vertices and stuff in order to be able to create more complex shape so you just digitally I sculpted this with your brains and a computer <laughs> you are so cool Holy <laughs> crap, that is fascinating like your understanding of shapes is rad <laughs> thank you well you also have to like know how to um paint a bit as well because i did hand paint um everything in uh it's a program called substance painter it comes with the adobe suite so basically you can import a three a virtual 3D model to hand paint uh, directly onto the, the piece. 
<laughs> y'all are so talented <laughs> you are too i checked out your instagram too medusa uh-huh. you be read too i just love stalking y'all's art like right now i am scrolling through james's portfolio i actually stalked him the other day too <laughs> yeah dude this is some good shit holy fuck you appreciate it yeah i was gonna say i really like all the rivets that you put on the on the plane i think that's like um it's an interesting detail and it's like each one has like you know it's they're they're like they feel physical right there's like light hitting it so it's like kind of kind of like indents the the surface a little bit right so yeah um, you use a normal map to do that there are different maps that do different things <laughs> and you input them like you have to connect them to certain things in the program in order for that to the it takes the lighting into account and stuff in order to uh, visualize that. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. I, I love, I love seeing the updates though. So yeah. So, um, Definitely. Yeah. It's, it's, it's so, um, so meticulous, everything. So, but every stage, <laughs> that, you know, like, every time I kind of see it, it's like, it's getting a little bit more, uh, it's almost, it's like convincing, right? It's like, it's a real, it's, it's like a real thing. I kind of believe that we, I, I believe like we're seeing 3D models all the time. Mm-hmm. And we don't, again, we don't register that it's a 3D model. We just sort of like, oh, that's a, that's a real thing. <laughs> that yeah. really <laughs> <laughs> like, What's you know, maybe, I've gotten confused. Yeah. Yeah. Like whenever, yeah, it's maybe more, maybe right now they're on screens. You know what I mean? But, <laughs> <laughs> not it. <laughs> well, funnily enough, I'll be watching yeah, a show. But... <laughs> <laughs> I'll be watching the show with somebody, and they'll think it's a cartoon, like a a hand drawn one. And um, it's gotten so good that you can fudge two D art with three D models. Um, so I'll they'll be like, "Oh, I wonder how they drew that." I'm like, "That's not drawn. That's a they built that." and they basically puppeteer it around, yeah. um, which is a whole different, I'm not good at animating, but um, that's a whole different uh, set of skills that like you can fudge different types of animation with each other uh, if you do it a certain way. So I'd, I'd almost say, let's go a little bit like in line with your thinking. Hey, so, uh, I was gonna say, uh, Steven, you had, some, you had uh, some work you were gonna show. Yeah, sure. I finished uh, my Bob skull yeah. over the week. Oh, cool. So uh, Bob Tyrell hosted our drawing group, and um, okay. we were drawing skulls this week. Let's ah! See. Neat. It's got a bit of a glow. That's under glass now. Yeah, we can see it. But it's really nice. Yeah, it's very yeah. nice. It's very cool. One. Yeah, I like how dark you were able to kind of push the um, you know, eye sockets and the nose, the nose socket too. I think that's it's darker than the reference, and I think that's like I think that helps it, you know, be really readable and effective. Let me double check and make sure that's yeah. very cool. And nice details on the teeth. And stuff. Oh, yeah. I feel like I could have put more time in the teeth, but. Um, I was pretty much over it by the time I, you know, finished those teeth. You know what I'm saying? I I do. <laughs> it's a lot of work. So is this on? Uh, is this uh, just charcoal or something on paper? Uh, yeah, it is charcoal. I did not decide to use the stencil, and um, I just put a grid on my paper, and uh, I drew it. So, just wanted to push it a little bit. You know, I haven't done charcoal drawing in a while, so. That's sick, dude. It's beautiful. Did you send Bob a picture of it? No, I figured, yeah. um, I was hoping he'd come in this, this evening. You think he'll show up? I'm hoping he will also. I have no idea. So yeah, Bob, Bob Tyrell gave us all his phone number last week. <laughs> so, he's like, just text me if you need anything. And it's like, okay. Yeah, I might send it. If you don't show up, I might send it to him. But I wasn't trying yeah. to like, uh, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to bug him either. Yeah, but yeah, you should definitely. It's awesome. I'm sure that he'll get a kick out of it. So um, yeah, you definitely send it. Um, yeah, I hope he shows up today. That'd be very cool. So, but thank you for thank you for sharing that. I I you know, 
And also, um, I'm like, now I'm wishing that, so I did mine graphite, but now I'm like, oh man, it's, it looks really cool in charcoal. I love doing charcoal too. So I think I'm. Do we get to see I'm yours, James? Being inspired. Um, yeah, I got mine. So. Yeah. Hey. Oh, wow, that's great. Thanks. Yeah. On white paper. I love, <laughs> <laughs> on white I paper. love the reflections um, on like the bottoms of the cheeks. It is uh uh yeah, it's not it's not nearly as like um it's not nearly as rich, I think was the you know, the charcoal, but um and I did, I printed mine out. I did the you know, I fell for the trap, I printed mine out, so um I uh I like I like the character that you were able to achieve with your Steven. It was you know, it has a um you know, again, there's like a sort of unique sort of quality to the drawing part of it and then you know all the details and the really deep values you were able to get with the charcoal so yeah I'm jealous I'm like <laughs> really jealous so I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to work on mine a little bit today before before tonight so sounds good yeah. that's mine that was what I did yeah. Amber how about you what have you been working on I was sick all week oh no oh no it's not like me to not create something but I was so sick no, it's the flu and the cold. Oh, feeling that better, is... being better. Yes, I'm feeling much. I didn't even go into the shop. I spent all week going, God, I wish I was better. I want to be at the shop. <laughs> hmm. Well, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you're on the mend now. And, uh, you know, so no, I saw like, uh, I saw something that you, I think you may put it on Instagram. It was like, a. Oh, yeah. I actually did that a while ago, but I never posted it after I painted it. Nice. I had posted the line work, but I didn't post it after I painted it. I'm like, oh, shit, I never posted that one. <laughs> so I posted that, but I did that weeks ago. Beautiful. No, that's that's got to be the secret to, <laughs> to posting stuff. <laughs> yeah, save it up and post it in. later. Yeah. Uh, Medusa, what are you working on? Um, Stuff. Uh, I'm not going to scare Elise with my, uh, dead stuff. No, don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's through a screen. It'll be fine. <laughs> uh, well, I've got, um, uh, another rat drying in the windowsill for when the sun comes up and bakes it so that, you know, the skin will, um, harden. Oh, uh, other things. <laughs> yeah. That's so interesting. <laughs> not gross at all. <laughs> not weird. Um, not weird. Everybody, I'm uh fairly normal. I, I collect I... weird taxidermy. Huh? I collect weird taxidermy, so you're fine. It's, it's super fun. Yeah, I got into um mounting beetles too, but I keep dropping them. I saw them fucking butterfingers over here so i spent my entire i spent like three hours on saturday trying to glue on the legs back on a beetle and i did a horrible job and he looks so mangled and awful but he's still cute and he's got most of his legs oh god uh, <laughs> yes i'm not good at you like <laughs> yeah Paige, no actually he's more like this and then his second set of legs are more like Oh, oops. I can't <laughs> display myself. His second set of legs are more of like, and then his other legs are, well, one of them's there. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, so other than that, I'm just, I'm making another, I'm making pieces for a shadow Ooh. box, and I drew this uh, woodland creature, and then I was going to paint some leaves, but they suck, so I'm going to color pencil those in instead. Oh, but nice. this is a, a combination of like gouache and acrylic ink. And I am going over it with color pencils for finer detail. And then I'm going to cut those shapes out, place them on top of each other for um, uh, depth and uh, use um, the scrap pieces of this 
foam board mm. um, to layer it and that make another shadow box. That first one you did was awesome. Yeah, Thanks. I saw it. It was pretty dope. Thanks. Yeah, it's at my workstation now and everybody keeps coming in and being on like, it's cooler in person. And I'm all like, thanks, I did that. <laughs> I also, I saw the Zelda stuff you were making too. That's was for that, the that next rat. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, <laughs> he's gonna, he's gonna be late. I actually, uh, actually uh, right next to the rat in the windowsill is an octo rat that I made out of Sculpey hey. and just painted because that's what he's going to be battling. Oh my God. I have, I, I sculpted a little, uh, don't you know the little like rabbit, the bloopies? It's called a bloopie from the uh, Breath of the Wild. So oh. The little like blue guys that run around. I have one of those I sculpted uh, a oh, while nice. ago. He's like yeah. a full size one though. <laughs> oh fucking cool yeah this uh this link guy i've got a whole scene in mind i've even made like little sculpey pots and everything uh and i'm using the designs from a link to the past mm. which is i mean if you've ever played a link to the past then it's a hands down the best zelda game ever undisputed <laughs> nobody can argue with that worldwide agreeance Con- I've never consensus. finished a Zelda game. I always start them and then I get they're hard. <laughs> yeah. They're really I get hard. Dumped. <laughs> I get I get to the last boss level and then I'm all like, I did great. <laughs> <laughs> and then I just don't have time anymore. Yeah, I have, well, oh, yeah. I have to go like wash my hair or something. <laughs> <laughs> but I made it there. I made it to the last boss. Um, <laughs> so yeah. But I'm doing a link to the past theme. So um, my Octora is is actually probably dry. He needs a second layer of coat. And then I think today, um, before my tattoo appointment, I'm going to finish sewing on Link's outfit and make his sword. And then I'll see you next week. Oh, God. (laughs) With another dead rat. You know, maybe it's exposure therapy for me. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's immersion therapy yeah <sighs> well i am uh I, again i i just want to like i want to thank everybody for coming today and uh you know please come next week we're gonna i'm sure we'll get all the technical issues and stuff fixed um and so uh again i you know um sorry about that that's uh it's not like me. <laughs> I swear to God, this never happens. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you know, anyway. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, thank you again so much for, you know, for everybody for coming and participating and uh, for sharing your stuff. It's again, it's like it. I look forward to seeing you all on Mondays. And, um, you know, it's it's really kind of like something that I, you know, I really treasure. And, you know, I really, you know, like it's super meaningful for me to be able to share some stuff with you as well. So um, anyway, uh, you know, we'll see you next week. And, uh, you know, I hope you all have a great week and, um, you know, draw, draw, draw. And uh, yeah, good luck on your tattoo appointment today, Medusa. Good luck. Fall asleep. No, don't fall asleep. (laughs) (laughs) You got to be careful, right? No promises. Tattoo shop. It should be a rule. Just like yeah. Steven said, like <laughs> you may wake up with something you, you didn't want. So. Don't fall asleep yeah. at the bar. Don't fall asleep at the tattoo no. shop. Oh, God. Am I going to have a, I probably have a wanted poster up. Yeah, yeah. oh, because you did. Yeah. Wanted, not <laughs> wanted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's make it a principle of, uh, yeah, of tattooing. Like, don't fall asleep during tattoo, you'll, yeah, I'm sorry. So. <laughs> but, um, yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to go. And uh, so thanks again, everybody. And uh, I'll see you next week. Have a good week. Thanks. Bye.